What up, JP Nation? It's your boy, JP, and today we're back with you with another reaction video. This one, I'm another making the case video by Clayton Crawley, greatest player of all time. And today we're going to be focusing on Kareem. Basketball is special. The size of the court and the lack of pads or helmets give fans the most intimate experience of a team sport that exists. And because of the different styles that basketball allows for, players develop their own distinct identities and signature styles through their creativity. Flair. And athleticism. And although no player succeeds alone, the scoring volume and two-way nature of the sport give individual stars a nearly unprecedented amount of control over the flow and outcome of a game. For this reason, players are constantly compared to their peers and to the legends of the past in order to answer the most hotly contested question in the sport. Who's the greatest to ever do it? For many, the question is redundant. They believe in only one right answer. Their answer. Others might have their own personal stance, but acknowledge one or two alternatives. But I believe that there's much more nuance to the question of greatness and more answers to it than you might think. By my count, there are eight players in NBA history that have a substantial claim as the GOAT. It's a subjective thing, though. I can't give you a definitive answer. All I can do is make the argument. So today, I'll be making the case for Kareem Abdul-Jabbar as the greatest basketball player of all time. What's the case for Kareem? Well, what do you want the case to be? I mean that honestly. Everybody looks for something a little different when it comes to evaluating the greatest of all time. Are you the type of person who wants a player with enough rings for two hands and an overflowing trophy case? Do you look for guys with transcendent peaks who dominated their era? How about someone who could extend their career over a long period of time? Whatever it is that you want out of your GOAT, please direct your attention to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I usually like to get a little more creative than just he did this, then he did this, then he did this. But that's how I'm going to start the Kareem case because his legacy involves a lot of things that happened away from the hardwood and this is the easiest way to go through them. So let's begin with our superhero's origin story. When it comes to our heroes, I think there are usually two types of beginnings that we love more than anything. The tale of the underdog who overcame the odds to become a household name, and the prodigy who is deemed the next chosen one and delivers on every ounce of promise. Kareem's story is of the second kind. In high school, Ferdinand Louis Alcinder Jr., Lou Alcinder, drew comparisons to Will Chamberlain. Mm. He torched the New York City high school basketball circuit and quickly became the most coveted basketball prospect in the nation. By the time he declared for college, Alcinder had lost just six games out of 102. His senior team was recognized as the greatest high school... Wow, God, if you play more than 100 games and only lost six? Ooh, wait. Man, you tell that you are something special, that you are, like, valuable. Like, man... Kareem Abdul-Jabbar only lost six games in high school? Wow. School basketball team of the 20th century. You can imagine how ecstatic John Wooden must have been when he heard that Alcindor had declared to become a UCLA Bruin. As was the case back then, college freshmen were barred from competing on varsity teams. And so, at the beginning of the year, Alcindor and the freshmen scrimmaged against the varsity squad that had just repeated as national champions. Alcindor notched 31 points and 21 rebounds. Wow. The freshman won by 15. Wow. On December 3rd, 1966, Alcindor began his collegiate basketball career in earnest. He scored 56 points in his first game. UCLA's single game scoring record still to this day. Wow. On January 14th, just 12 games into the season, the Saturday Evening Post echoed a question asked 11 years prior about another of basketball's most revered figures. There was a genuine fear that Alcindor was too good, that the sport of basketball would suffer from a lack of compelling parity so long as he played it. The question was well founded. By the end of the season, Alcindor had led the Bruins to an undefeated record, won the national championship, and claimed every relevant player of the year award that existed. The NCAA had already seen enough. Shortly after UCLA's championship win over Dayton in 1967, college basketball's governing body banned the dunk, a rule that would stand until 1976. When you're so good, 
and it just makes it so unfair for everybody to compete against you. And they made a rule, the dunk rule, to ban the dunk. Ban the dunk. Like, you, you could just tell that you have incredible talent and nobody couldn't stop you, that you were so dominating that they had to ban the dunk from you. That, that that's just that is crazy. That is crazy. Like that is just unbelievable. That just tells you how great of a player you are. I mean, goodness gracious, Ben in the dunk. Wow. While the NCAA gave various explanations as to why they chose to ban the dunk now, most observers knew that the rule was instituted with one person in mind. The rule became known as the Lou Alcindor rule. It took a teenage Lou Alcindor just 30 games to change the way that college basketball was played at a fundamental level for nearly a decade. Have the rules name after you? Wow. Something else took place in the summer of 1967 that would shape Lou Alcindor's legacy just as much as the ban of the dunk. In June, many professional athletes of color met in Cleveland at Jim Brown's request in order to discuss whether they would support Muhammad Ali's refusal to be drafted into the Vietnam War. Okay, that was of those who convened at the summit, four athletes sat at the foremost table. The NBA's elder statesman, Bill Russell, Ali himself, legendary former NFL running back, Jim Brown, and Lou Alcindor. Here were the preeminent figures of their sports, legendary men who had all endured lives of hardship, and next to them sat a 20-year-old, an amateur in solidarity. Throughout his childhood in Upper Manhattan, Alcindor had experienced prejudice not just because of his height, but because of his race. An infamous incident involving his high school coach was just one instance that had strengthened Alcindor's resolve to become a civil rights advocate. The use of the word was, you can't allow the idiots, I mean there are idiots that ever can't, can't allow those idiots sitting way up in the stands to look down and say you're playing like a nigga. There are very few things that I regret doing in my life, that's one of Wow. He did not call me a nigger. I, I've never said that, but uh, the word did come up in the conversation and uh, it had a very negative effect on me. At that summit, college basketball's brightest star signaled to the world that he was indeed more than an athlete. His virtuosity as an athlete was never in question, though, as Alcindor's junior season cemented him as the sport's most talented amateur. The team lost just one game en route to another championship and another Most Outstanding Player award for Alcindor. But Alcindor's second championship was greeted with little talk of what a fantastic talent he had proven to be, overshadowed by his attendance at a November meeting during which West Coast athletes met to discuss a potential Olympic boycott. Mm. The meeting included Tommy Smith and John Carlos, athletes who ultimately would participate in the Olympics and give us this iconic image. Oh, After yeah. the media got wind that this meeting had happened, Alcindor was interviewed and his patriotism, loyalty, motivations, and influences were all brought into question and condemned. Alcindor was painted as a traitor, someone who was spitting in the face of the country that had done so much to improve his life, never mind the fact that the same country still allowed landlords to racially segregate neighborhoods as a matter of law. He received death threats and hate mail full of racial epithets. These did nothing to deter him from his activism, participating in student protests and attending multiple civil rights rallies. But Alcindor, already a shy, reserved, and introspective person, developed a deep mistrust of the media. He worried that they only wanted to use him and his name for their own interests and agendas. He would carry that skepticism with him well into his professional career. For as talented as he was as an athlete, he refused to be defined by his fame. Mm. The scrutiny also did nothing to hinder his basketball mastery. Another year later, Alcindor found himself in possession of a third championship ring and another trove of accolades as college basketball's most outstanding player. In his three years as a varsity player for the Bruins, Alcindor won three national championships and was the national player of the year three times. In 90 collegiate games, he lost twice. Wow. He is the greatest college basketball player of all time, and to pretend otherwise is... Like I said, he only lost six games in high school and played over 100 games. And then in college, he played over 90-something games and only lost two and won three titles and won most outstanding player three times. Dominance, the greatest college basketball player of all time, man. And it, it kind of sucks with, you know, the social justice and, you know, not really taunting basketball. Like, it overshadowed his basketball ability and his accolades because of what he believed in and everything. He, the one thing I really respect about him is that he never changed himself. Never. Like, the media, like, get so mad at him because, 
you know, they, they was like, we gave you everything and they expect him to return back to believe what the media and everyone wants to believe him, but he never changed himself because he went through prejudice, you know, in his life and he go through these student protests and he is an activist. He was, he never changed himself. That's the one thing I really respect about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And even though that you want to overshadow his basketball legacy because of that, that's kind of sad because he was a great basketball player. This to me akin to denying the curve of the earth. In the 1969 NBA Draft, the Phoenix Suns and the Milwaukee Bucks, the worst teams in the league, flipped a coin to decide who would have the first pick. Here's a video of Phoenix's front office being told that they would be denied Lou Alcindor's basketball talents. Dang. Look at his face. <laughs> With his 7'2 frame, Alcindor could use his size and stature against just about every center in the league, save for guys like Wilt and Nate Thurmond. He didn't have the mass of a guy like Shaq, so he played a game that was based on a surprising amount of finesse. Watching yes, his so younger years, you're struck by how fluid and maneuverable he was at his yes. height, combined with a level of athleticism that has been lost to time. He boasted speed at his size and an incredible endurance, taking physical beatings nearly every night. He was a remarkable passer, even leading the 75 bucks in total assists. His defense was prodigious, earning him 11 all-defensive selections in his career. He had a soft touch around the basket and held total command in the post, aided by his signature shot, the most unstoppable, impregnable shot in any the player's sky hook. ever. The Look sky at that skyhook! The ban of the dunk during his college career had yielded an unintended consequence. Alcindor was forced to hone his skills away from the rim, resulting in a shot that was nearly automatic. The shot was efficient, simple, Thank you, NCAA. effective, and has never been replicated. Thank you. There's so much to talk about with Kareem, and I can't feasibly go through every year of his career and pick out all of the stats and accolades that show just how much ass he kicked, so we have to stick to the important stuff. Like when he won his first MVP and his first championship in his second year in the league. Alcindor and a just past his prime Oscar Robertson went toe to toe with Nate Thurmond, Jerry Lucas, Wilt Chamberlain, Jerry West, Elgin Baylor, Gus Johnson, Earl Monroe, and Wes Unsell. That's talent. All Hall of Famers to win the title. In that entire postseason, against all of those Hall of Famers, the Bucks lost two games. Wow. Just two weeks after his 24th birthday, he won finals MVP. After slapping the bullets with 27 points and 18 rebounds a game on 60% shooting in a four-game sweep, Lou Alcindor became a champion before Jerry West did. The day following the championship, Lou Alcindor officially changed his name to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, having privately converted to Islam during his time at UCLA. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar proceeded to kick so much ass during the 1970s that I'm amazed he didn't break his feet. He was unassailably the league's best player from the moment he stepped onto the court in 1970 through to the very end of the decade. The gap between him and the league's second best player was as expansive as it's ever been for any player. In 10 seasons, from 1971 to 1980, Kareem won six most valuable player awards, more than any other player has ever won. Crazy. For the decade of the 70s, he averaged a 28-14-4 with another 3.5 blocks and 1.2 steals a game on 55% shooting. Aside from his injury-shortened 75 season, he was an All-NBA selection every year and made eight All-Defensive teams. The only thing missing from his decade-long stranglehold of the sport of basketball was more championships. He came close a couple of times, including a seven-game loss to the Celtics in 74. And guess why he didn't win more rings? You guessed it, he couldn't get a good team around him. But Kareem has a legitimate gripe here. After 72, Oscar's productivity dropped dramatically, and until Magic joined the Lakers in 1980, Kareem never played with an elite guard again. Remember how Kareem led the 75 bucks in assists? That's a cool stat to throw out there, but it's indicative of the fact that the Bucks lacked playmakers, let alone somebody who could be the second best player on a championship winning team. Kareem asked to be traded after the 75 season because, as you can imagine, this seven foot two, introverted black activist Muslim who had grown up in New York City and gone to college in LA didn't exactly feel at home in 1975 Wisconsin. The team obliged in the offseason, sending Kareem to the Lakers in exchange for just about every good player the Lakers had. 
He had some more outstanding seasons for the Lakers, but again was never able to find a running mate that could help him get back to the top. Whatever. It doesn't change the fact that the conversation about who the best basketball player of the 70s was begins and ends with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I know that talking about a peak Kareem kind of seems weird because he's the guy with the goofy goggles and the bald spot and the funny mustache. But don't forget about the guy who could average 34 and 16 for a season and drag his team to 50 plus wins by himself. Don't forget about the guy who won six MVPs in 10 years. Don't forget about the guy who Dr. J, among other legends, calls the greatest of all time. Mm. So if Kareem kicked so much ass during the 70s, why don't we remember him the way we do with Dr. J? Well, you know how everybody talks about how Larry and Magic saved the NBA when they came into the league? Well, there were a lot of reasons the NBA needed saving. Drugs, the ABA split, tape-delaying playoff games, a lack of dynasties. And honestly, because Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was the league's best player. For one, watching Kareem was not fun. He was effective. He was dominant. But he wasn't exciting. He didn't have acrobatic dunks like Michael, show-stopping passes like Magic, or the thunderous power of Shaq. He had the skyhook, reliable and consistent, rarely thrilling, and never marketable. As far as his personality and ability to give the fans something to connect with, I read one word used to describe his attitude towards media and the public more than any other as I researched Kareem. Aloof. <laughs> Not friendly or forthcoming. Cool and distant. Conspicuously uninvolved and uninterested, typically through distaste. Kareem, jaded from his interactions with the media in college and his encounters with racism, was a notoriously difficult person to interview. He just wasn't interested in being famous. He wasn't interested in being the face of the league. He wanted to be respected, not just as a basketball player, but as a person. Any attempt by fans or the press to get to know him or get something out of him was met with suspicion. Kareem let his celebrity die willingly, even intentionally. And because he was so incomparably good, nobody could supplant him as the best player in the world and basketball's popularity so Sounded like a little bit like Tim Duncan. Like Tim Duncan was just quiet and like it wasn't interesting at all. Watching him, he wasn't an exciting player. He used the fundamentals. If you're a real hooper and you love fundamentals, you know, you love watching Kareem Abdul Jabbar play because he had fundamentals and had finesse though. But yeah, he was not a media person, you know. They didn't care about being the face of the league. He wanted to be respected. Like I said earlier, he never changed himself. Never changed himself. Just say reserved, quiet person against the media and everything. So, you know, he wasn't an, he wasn't he was an exciting player, but if you know basketball, like, he was a great player. Suffered. Can basketball survive Lou Alcindor? It almost didn't. You knew this was coming. Kareem's longevity is the defining aspect of his career. He played for 20 years, and it wasn't really until his last year that he lost his fastball. In those 20 years, he was a 19-time All-Star made the playoffs 18 times, and made 15 All-NBA teams. He appeared in 10 finals and won six championships. He was so good for so long that he won playoff series against Wilt Chamberlain and against Isaiah Thomas. Mm. That longevity gave way to a set of records at Kareem's retirement that are matched by Wilt. Wow. And as you're looking at these, contemplating how a guy could stay competitive and relevant for 20 solid years, remember the era that Kareem played in and the fact that he spent four years in college playing at a championship level. Of all Crazy. of these records, get a load of these three. We already talked about his six MVPs, but he received plenty of MVP votes throughout the 80s, even finishing fifth in 1986 at the age of 38. He finished with the most points of any player ever. The lethal efficiency of the skyhook made it easy for Kareem to keep up a steady scoring diet, even as he got on in years. So if you love scores, and the first thing you do when people talk about the GOAT is bring up how many points they could get, here's your guy. Mm. All-time scorer in NBA history. And there's this, the truest sign of his extended dominance. Winning finals MVPs 14 years apart. One at age 23, the other at age 37. The gap between those two awards spans more time than the careers of Magic, Bird, Russell, or Jordans. In 1985, the Lakers had won 62 games and were the top seed in their conference. 
The Kareem Magic Balancing Act had gotten about as close to an equilibrium as they would get to together, helping the Lakers tear through the playoffs all the way to the finals where they met Larry Bird and the Boston Celtics. Now at this point, the Lakers had never beaten the Celtics in the finals ever. They were 0-8, going all the way back to when the Lakers played in Minneapolis. And after game one, it looked like wow. the Celtics were going to make it 0-9. Boston won 148-114, to a victory that became known as the Memorial Day Massacre. Yep. The most notable deficiency on the Lakers was their center. Held to just 12 points and three rebounds, Parrish and McHale had run Kareem ragged on the court, gobbling up rebounds, playing physically inside, and having their way with him. Kareem looked expired, the Lakers were embarrassed, and the future of their team was in jeopardy. Pat Riley says, if we hadn't won in 85, I would have probably gotten fired. Because we won in 82, lost in 83, choked in 84, and 85 was the last year of my contract. Mm. I had to win. And so in the off days, between games 1 and 2, Riley hammers his team. None more than Kareem. And Kareem asks for more. In game 2... This is again horrendous on the offensive board. Kareem going to double team Kevin as much as they possibly can. Kareem steals the pass. Kareem. Sky hook by double team. Dennis Johnson gets work oh. in the air. Kareem blocks it. Uh, the board for the result. Kareem going in on a pass. Just a side note, um, Pat Wiley and a really great move um, between game one and two after that devastating game one and the press was hard on Kareem too as well. Pat Wyatt let like family come to the team bus and he let Kareem's parents come to the team bus, make him feel comfortable and give him motivation for game two. And this is what we got here from Kareem in game two. The fire was still there. The fire was still there. Let's go Kareem. Pass for Magic Johnson. Four on the shot clock. Kareem goes up and stuffs it through with two seconds to go. Mm. Mm. Against Kupchak. Blocked by Kareem. In the backcourt, Kareem is back in the game and hits the sky hook. Kareem. 24 for Kareem. Boy, he's fighting Robin Pat. This there is going to be a ton of fun before it's over. Kareem inside. Going strong to the basket and 30 points for Kareem. Mm. Lakers are in the penalty. Michael Cooper is open again and he hits a cup to him. He is playing like a rookie. Watch him come over on this shot to really swat it away. Get out of here, Kevin McHale. <laughs> After game one, Kareem averaged a 28-10-6 at age 37 against the greatest front court in NBA history. The Lakers won in six. Curse over. 14 years after his first championship, he was still good enough to be the best player on the best team against the best competition that the world had to offer. This is where I talk about all the other stuff that doesn't fit neatly into other categories or they're important but don't deserve a category of their own. First, let's talk about Magic and Kareem because I feel like that's the elephant in the room right now. Every time someone starts talking about Kareem as the greatest ever, they point out that he has six championships, the magic number because it's just as many as Michael Jordan won. Then somebody comes back and says, no, he won five of them with Magic, and he only has two finals MVPs, so Magic carried him to the other four. And then that's usually where the conversation ends. But not today, baby. If I'm arguing for Kareem as the greatest player of all time, which I am, I'd point out that when the Lakers won the title in 1980, Kareem was the best player on the team, and I would argue that he had a more impressive final series than Magic did. We all remember 1980 as the finals where Magic put up 42 points, 15 rebounds, and 7 Kareem assists to clinch the title. It was, in many respects, the signaling of a new era of NBA basketball, what many people still call the sport's golden age. And that's a neat narrative that previews Magic's rise to superstardom, but what? In the first five games of the series, Kareem, who would later be named Busted. the regular season's MVP, averaged 33-14 and, mm -hmm. and blocked 23 shots. In Game 5, with the series tied at two apiece, Kareem sprained his ankle halfway through the third quarter. After being helped to the locker room, he hobbled back onto the court, unwilling to let this chance slip away. He proceeded to cap off a 40-point, 15-rebound performance by slamming through the game-winning dunk with just over 30 seconds left. 
Magic was fantastic throughout the series and obviously had the big game to win it all, but Kareem was the one who put them in position to win the series in the first place. So why didn't he win it? Gee, I don't know. Who do you think the media wanted to give the award to <laughs> The sullen, quiet center who had just spent the last decade giving them the finger every time they asked a question? Or the charismatic, flashy rookie with the ear-to-ear -ear smile who clinched the series Media's along like, the Take that! In 82, that. Magic started putting up eye-popping stats on the offensive end and had an outstanding final series. But he had yet to take the torch from Kareem. Following an argument with then-head coach Paul Westfall, Magic had asked for a trade earlier that season. Lakers owner Jerry Buss instead fired Westfall and replaced him with Pat Riley. Magic's reputation in the locker room and in the public eye suffered. Plus, Norm Nixon was still playing long stretches of games at point guard, leaving Magic without a definitive claim as the team's alpha dog. We already talked about the 1985 series. And then, in 1987 and 88, yeah, Magic was easily the best player on the team. And the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, that was 39 and 40 respectively, was either the second or third best player on those championship teams. Doesn't it count for something that he was still a go-to guy for championship teams as he was pushing 40? Alright, maybe this one can be like a little mini section. Ready? Whenever we think of guys who are clutch, we always think of perimeter guys. Reggie, Ray, Jordan, Kobe, LeBron, Durant, Bird, and so on. So, does that mean there's no such thing as a clutch center? Heck no, you dumb dumb. <laughs> if you need two points in crunch time, what would you trust more than the most awesome weapon of basketball certainty ever created? Plus, if you're afraid that Kareem might get fouled and miss the free throws, he was a 72% shooter from the line during his career and shoot. topped out around 78%. Yes. He wasn't a sure bet, but in big time situations, Kareem had a knack for him. Is it really crazy to think of Kareem as being clutch? Here, I'll show you. 1979, Magic's first NBA yep. game. The Lakers trailed the Clippers by one at the end of regulation. Sky Hook. NBA Finals, Game 4. The sequence is most memorable because of Magic's baby skyhook, but in two must-score situations, the Lakers put the ball in Kareem's hand. First, they threw an alley-oop to Kareem, and then, on the next play, down one, Kareem was able to draw the foul. 1988 NBA Finals, Game 6. The famous Isaiah Thomas game. After spraining his ankle in the third quarter, Isaiah stayed in the game and heroically capped off a 25-point quarter. That was an amazing. Finals record. That was an amazing. Needing to win the game to stay alive and force a Game 7, Kareem spoiled the Pistons parade with 27 seconds left. As the Lakers gave their 41-year-old center the ball, he drew a foul. Everybody still talks about this play. Like, did Bill and Bill Willie foul Kareem Abdul Jamal? Like... I mean, they called it, but I mean, th this one was like a debate and still a debate to this day, like whether or not this was a foul or not, though. But Kareem did hit his free throws. Five with 14 seconds to go. Kareem with the ball. Made both free throws and the Lakers won the game. 1974 NBA Finals, Game 6 against the Celtics. Down 3-2, to two, the game is in double overtime, and the Bucks are down 1 with 7 seconds left. Their season hangs on the next possession. Who else would they go to? Boom. A clutch center. The NBA has seen its fair share of media-savvy athletes like Magic and LeBron and Michael. There has never been, and there will never be, a 10-hour documentary on Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Michael Jordan was an infinitely more entertaining player to watch and a more interesting person for the media to interview. But does the fact that Michael Jordan was more exciting or popular mean that he was a better player? Not necessarily. Think of it this way. If you needed to cut an apple, and you saw a guy with a samurai sword throw the apple in the air, do some crazy slashes at the speed of light, and saw the apple come down cut into pieces, you'd be impressed, right? You'd take a picture of it, you'd remember it, you'd probably tell your friends about it. But is that guy in his samurai sword any better at slicing an apple than one of those steel things you keep <laughs> in your kitchen drawer at home? I mean, is it exciting? 
Not really. Are you going to tell your friends about it? Probably not. But when it comes to cutting apples, doesn't it get the job done just as well? He was clutch, had the most unstoppable move in NBA history, won six championships, six MVPs, had 20 years of excellence, and a peak that ranks among the highest ever. Oh, and he's also the most accomplished college basketball player ever. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar enjoyed the greatest career of any player. He succeeded at every level of the sport to a greater degree than anyone else. And with a level of attention and scrutiny that has few equals in American basketball history. He's the greatest of all time. Just pick a case. That was the end of the video, man. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, like I said, personally he is in my top three greatest players of all time. You know, with Michael and LeBron. Um, Kareem had the most devastating shot in NBA history. Like I said, with the sky hook, he was clutch. He was an amazing player. He had finesse. He had touch. Um, you know, the thing about the sky hook that, you know, he had like so much great balance. Like that sky hook is very hard. Like if you try to do it outside, you know, on the court, you know, go to a gym with a court inside and you try to do the sky hook, it's so hard that it's balance. He had so much balance. So and he was just an unbelievable player. Yeah, he wasn't an interesting player because of him against the media and he was quiet and reserved. Hell, Tim Duncan was the same way. He was quiet and reserved. So, but you know, but you know, does that make, does that make him like, you know, you know, an exciting player? No, of course not. But does that, does that like really tarnish him as like the greatest basketball player or, you know, the best player in the war? Of course not. Of course not. If you know who's the best player in the war, like will Hoopers know who the best player in the war is? So, Definitely comment down below and tell me if Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is the greatest player in your opinion or where would you put him at in the discussion as the greatest players of all time. Hopefully y'all put him in the top three. Y'all better put him in the top three. So definitely comment down below on that. Definitely if you're new, subscribe down below to It's Just JP for more basketball content on the road to 2,000 subscribers. Click the notification bell. You will know what my next upload is. And man, this was a great video by Clayton Qualley and making the case I enjoy his videos. Until next time, I'm JP and we out of here. Peace.